We've been in a sermon series for several weeks now called 24. And I, I kind of based it off that television series 24, where the whole one hour episode takes place in 24 hours. And um, the reason I, I chose that for this time is because we have been preaching through the Gospel of John, the book of John, and uh, for about oh, three or four chapters, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, in the book of John, it's, it's the last 24 hours before Jesus is crucified. And he's spending time with his, his closest disciples, and he's giving them really rich teaching that's, that's very important. And, and so we've been looking at that, that what, what did Jesus teach in that last 24 hours before his crucifixion? And uh, I don't know about you, but I've, I've learned a lot, and it's, it's inspired me, but I hope it has you too. And so today we're continuing that series, and, and so here's what's going on at, at, at this point. We're in John 15, actually, so if you want to turn in your Bibles to John 15. Jesus, in John 13 and 14... Has, has been in the upper room with his disciples. And he starts out by washing their feet. And we, we talked about that. And, and then he, uh, he talks about so many different things. That there's so many important teachings. Last week we talked about peace. He said, peace I give you. Not like the world gives, but I give you my peace. And at, it was shortly after that, it says they, they got up from the table and they left. Okay, so they were... They were making their way to the garden where Jesus would be praying. Remember, he spent his last few hours there in the garden praying, and that's where they arrested him. That's where they picked him up. So even though it doesn't um, explicitly say this, it, it's very, very probable that, that as they were moving from the upper room um, to the garden where Jesus would be praying, in the way Jer Jerusalem's laid out, they would have gone through... Um, at least a few vineyards, grape, grape vineyards, right? And so as they're walking along, and Jesus is always so good at this, he takes something in nature and, and he'd have a very powerful teaching point from it. And so even though it doesn't explicitly say this, it's very probable that they stop at a vineyard and Jesus um, gives this discourse that we're going to read in John 15. So we'll pick it up there with that kind of being the background. John 15, um, starting in verse 1, we'll read through verse 11. This is Jesus speaking. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. If you look a little more carefully at what Jesus is saying there, if you kind of take some time and sort of break that down a little bit, Jesus is saying that believers, well, I guess we call Christians, all right, hopefully they're followers, followers of Christ, fall basically into four categories. And I actually have an illustration there. You, you're wondering what this is all about, right? Oh, we must be talking about fruit today. So we have a, an illustration. The, this is an illustration of the four categories that Christians, uh, you'll be in one of the four categories. You are one of these boxes, all right? Jesus said there are 
there are believers, there are Christians who bear no fruit. So there are Christians that look like this. There's no fruit there. All right? Doesn't mean they're not going to heaven. Just means there's no fruit. Because he, he calls them my, who, who are in me. All right? So we know that they're Christians. All right? <laughs> I'll be careful how I say this because I want you to take it wrong, but you don't have to bear fruit to go to heaven. You have to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to go to heaven. All right? Does he want you to bear fruit? Absolutely. But Jesus said there are some, and we're going to look at this more in depth in a little bit, there are some who bear no fruit. And, and he says that that's the one that they, the Father takes away. Now, that there, I'm going to speak to that in a minute. It's a really bad translation, and I'm going to show you why that's bad, and, and I'm not the only one that has discovered that. But, but anyway, this could be you. <laughs> This was me. I don't, you know, I've been here. Um, Jesus, the next category that Christians can fall into is those that bear some fruit. Right? There's a little bit there. Can you see it? There's a little bit of fruit in there. Some Christians are like that. They have, they have a little bit of fruit. But then he says there's Christians that have more fruit. And then he goes on to say there, there, are, there are believers who have much fruit. You, you are in, in one of these four categories. And I know, oh, you can't categorize me. I'm, I didn't. Jesus did. <laughs> and, and so this morning, I want you to really kind of do an introspective and see as a, if you're a believer. If you're not, you, you, you can be here quickly. If you're not a believer, you, you can get here. It doesn't take long if, if you'll make the right decisions to do that. But, but where are you this morning? Are, are, you a, are you a believer that just doesn't have really any fruit to speak of? Do you, do you have a some fruit? Or do you have more fruit or much fruit? Because Jesus, obviously, where does he want you? He wants you to bear much fruit. Not even more fruit. I mean, that's nice. But he wants you to go from, if you're at no fruit, to some fruit, to more fruit, to much fruit. And Jesus expects and enables you to bear much fruit. He expects it, and he enables you to do it. I've, well, I guess you can, you can form your own opinion about me if you think I'm here or not. I'm not, but I, I feel like I've experienced most, if not all, of these levels. Okay, but if you don't think so, that's fine. You can have that opinion. But I, can I tell you something that I know from experience that I think the Bible would also bear out? This is a much easier life to live than this. You would think, you would think, and a lot of Christians wrongly think, that this is easier because I don't have to do anything. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you why this is not easy. Yeah, you're not doing a lot of the things, you're doing a lot of things, you're just not doing a lot of the right things. Okay? In, in, in my life, and in the life of believers you can read in the Bible, this is, e this is an easier life to live than this. So why do we live this life? Well, we'll, we'll hopefully flesh that out as we, we talk about this, uh, that this morning. But we have to understand that Jesus enables you and expects you to, to be here. It's not pie in the sky. And you can get there. You can get there quickly. So... So what, is, what does fruit look like? I mean, I know I'm using this as, as an example. But it's like, well, do I really have to produce apples and grapes and strawberries? And I don't know what that thing is. And banana, you know, it's a bountiful basket thing. But, but, you know, so that's a metaphor, right? So what is fruit? If you would ask me, you know, years ago, do you have fruit in your life? Oh, yeah. You know, I got a nice wife. That is, I got, you know, two healthy boys. There's some fruit. I got a good job, business, you know. There's fruit there. Can I just lovingly say that's not fruit? Those are blessings. Those are blessings. Fr fruit, the Bible's very clear what fruit is. 
And so we have to understand what is the fruit because we can go along in life kind of fooling ourselves that there's fruit in our life when it's really not fruit. I'm not saying it's bad stuff. It could be really good stuff. It could be blessings from the Lord, but that's different than fruit. So let's look at what fruit is. Uh, um, there's, there's an inward fruit and there's an outward fruit. All right? Inward and outward fruit. And, and the Bible teaches us to recognize what that fruit looks like. Okay? So let's talk first about inward fruit. Galatians 5.22, the first part of that says this. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. So here he's going to tell it what it is. Here's, here's how you recognize it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Nine of them there. Fruits of the Spirit. That's more, I guess, what you'd call an inner fruit. Now, can people... Does that go on the outside? Yes. I mean, it starts on the inside, and people sense that. And a lot of it has to do with your relationship. So in that sense, it's outward. I understand that. But it's more of an inward work. Do you understand? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, all, all those things, self-control. Here's something that's interesting that I didn't, I didn't study out until, I don't know, a few months ago. The word fruit is in, in the Greek, which the New Testament was written in, is karpos. It's, it's a noun, because it's a thing, you know, person, place, or thing. So it's a thing, but in the Greek, it's a singular noun. It's not plural. And, and a lot of times we think, well, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, uh, you know, it's love, joy, peace, patience, kind. Well, I've got the, I've got the fruit of joy or I've got the fruit of love, or I've got the fruit of kindness, but I don't only really have the fruit of patience. I don't only really have the fruit of, of um, gentleness. I don't have the fruit of self-control. Do you know it's all one fruit? It's one fruit. And, and, and if, you're, if you're controlled by the Holy Spirit, if you're walking in the Spirit, you will have all of those. You're like, well, you're crazy because I have some and not all of them. That's be <laughs> Why don't you have all of them? Because we don't always fully walk in the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, we try to, we want to, the Bible says to, but, but, you know, we can be walking in the Holy Spirit and then we take a step over here and start walking in the flesh, right? I'm telling you, because the Bible says it, if you're totally, totally walking in the Holy Spirit letting, and yielding to the Holy Spirit, letting him lead and guide you and speak to you, and follow him, you will have the fruit of the Spirit, which is all of those together. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and all that stuff. Even self-control. <laughs> That's a fruit of the Spirit I don't have. <laughs> it's one fruit. Do you understand? And, and so, it's just a matter of, of yielding to the Holy Spirit. But that's the kind of fruit that we should be, that's what we should recognize. So when I say, you know, your, your lovely kids aren't fruit, I'm not saying that, that, that they're evil or bad. I, I'm just saying that they're a great blessing, and that's wonderful, but they're not fruit. Fruit is, are these things. Now, should there and could there be fruit you know, with your kids and in your kids? Absolutely. Can, can there and should there be fruit in your, in your business or your career? Absolutely. Is it fruit itself? No, it's not. But, but it, it, should, it should be there, right? Does it make sense? So we've got, to be, we've got to be cognizant of what we're calling fruit. It's, it's, you know, we don't get to define what fruit is. We, the Bible defines what fruit is. And so now we've seen what the, kind of the inward um, fruit is. So, what, so what's the outward fruit? Paul tells us in Titus, Titus 3.14. He says, let our people, meaning believers, also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. So we can deduct from that, good works are fruit. Good works that meet urgent needs. All right. Does that include like raking somebody's lawn who is not able to do it? Sure, that's fruit. That's, that's meeting a need. And uh, taking somebody a meal, is that fruit? Yep, meeting a need. It, and I, I hate to admit this as a pastor, but I, I guess I'm admitting it. it. It wasn't until, well, 
halfway through, I guess, being a pastor at this time, years ago, that I used, um, let me back up. I used to think that, that good works were pretty much limited to raking elderly people's lawns, taking meals to people, go visiting people in the nursing home. Those are good works. But I thought, that's okay, that's, that's the good works. But then as I began to study what Jesus did, right, when he's on the earth, because he did, he's the master of good works, right? What did he do? Save people, heal people, deliver people from the grip of the enemy and the influence of the enemy. He discipled them, he taught them, right? What's more urgent for somebody, to get their lawn raked or to get saved? So they, so they end up in hell with a nice-looking yard. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying don't go help people. I'm not saying that, but what are their urgent needs? Or you, you deliver somebody a meal, which is nice and very helpful, and it shows the love of Christ. And that could be part of the fruit, love, you know, kindness, all that stuff. But if you do that and somebody's just caught up in this uh, influence of the enemy and this emotional yuck that the, that the enemy has just perpetrated on their life and they need to be delivered from the bondage of the enemy, is, isn't that more urgent? Right? I mean, yeah, when you need a sandwich, you need a sandwich. I understand. You need to eat to live. And that, but, but for people who are... Who, there are a lot of people who have an urgent need to be delivered from the from the grip of the enemy. Those are good works. Getting people saved is a good work. Getting people delivered from the enemy is a good work. Teaching people, discipling them is a good work. Healing people is a good work. If you read in the Gospels, that's what Jesus did most of. He's healing this person and healing that person. And you might wonder if you're newer to this church, why do we talk about healing a lot? Because it's what Jesus did. A lot. A lot. He also made people sandwiches, fish sandwiches. <laughs> he did that because that was important, right? They needed to eat. All right, so he shows us that's a good work too. So anyway, we, we, have, to, we have to understand what, what these good works, what they, what they are and what they look like. So do you, do you have an understanding, okay, what we can call um, fruit and what maybe isn't fruit is something else, you know, a, a blessing or a gift or whatever? Love, it's inward. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control, faithfulness. And then the good works, getting people saved, healed, delivered, discipled. There's a big difference between fruit and leaves. <laughs> you look at this, there's, there's no leaves here. I know those things look like leaves, but they're not really leaves. It's fruit, okay? There, there's a story, and we even talked, uh, JC talked about it in Sunday school this morning in our adult class, kind of referred to it. Uh, but there's a, a story in the Bible, a historical account of Jesus walking through um, the city, and he's hungry. The Bible says he's hungry. And, and he sees a fig tree with leaves on it. And with fig trees, the fruit and the leaves appear at the same time. I don't know how that happens, but... They do. So if you see a fig tree with leaves, there's fruit there. And so Jesus is hungry, and he sees a fig tree, and he walks over to it, and there's no figs. And, and the Bible says he curses it. He said, may you never produce another fig. They come back the next day, that tree's withered and dead. Okay, and people say, oh, man, he was mad. He, just, he did that out of anger. No, he, he was trying, what he was trying to do was, was he was... Um, teaching a lesson, he was using a metaphor to show the problem with religion or uh, what I would refer to as religiosity. Religion is full of a bunch of leaves, all right? It, it, if, you, if you drive down the road, um, if you drive down the East Shore of Flathead Lake, ever been along East Shore Flathead Lake? It's Highway 35. They've got all those, those cherry orchards there. I mean, if you're just kind of driving and trying to pay attention, because you really got to pay attention on that road, otherwise you're going to end up in Flathead Lake. But it's curvy and there's lots of vehicles there. But you can see these beautiful trees with their leaves everywhere. But in, until you get closer, you don't know if they have cherries on them or not, right? So, 
so leaves can kind of be this advertisement. Hey, look at me. I'm, I'm something. I'm a cherry tree. It's like, hey, well, you're a cherry tree with no fruit. You're a fig tree with no fruit. And, and Jesus was trying to make a, a point by saying, if you're not going to have fruit, don't be advertising that you're all that. Don't be out there, hey, look at me. I'm, I'm going to church every time the doors open. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And I'm, you know, it's like the proof is in the fruit. So leaves and fruit are two different things. And so many believers have got caught up in religion, religiosity. And, and they're all about the leaves. Look at me. How, do I, how am I looking? It's like, well, leaves are nice, but unless there's fruit there, you know, we don't have a lot to talk about. And, and that's what Jesus is trying to say. He's not, he's not saying it in a, in a way to guilt or shame you. He's just saying this is an expectation. It's, it actually, it's, it's actually more of a command to bear fruit than a, than a suggestion. So, so what, if, what if this is you? I mean, it might be. I've been here. Nothing to be, I mean, there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's going to heaven. Not much, you know, to take with you there, but, but, but what if this is you? And when I, when I ask you, where, where are you? I'm not asking where you wish you were. Where are you today? Because what if this is you? And I, I know I spent a lot of time here, and I know a lot of believers do, and I, it's not a, a place for guilt, shame, and condemnation. It's a place for motivation. All right? What, what's going on here? Let's, let's talk about that. If you're producing no fruit, God the Father is at work trying to separate you from the contamination of this world so you can produce some fruit. For those of you who are keeping track in your sermon notes in your bolt, and I'll give you a minute to write that down because contamination is a hard word to write down. Contamination. Remember I said that there was a really bad translation in this passage we read today? Because this was originally written in Greek, and then when they, they, they're just words are different, so they try and come up with the English words that fit. All right? In verse 2, um, it says that he cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. All right? Or as cuts off, takes away, depends on... So, so this you know fruit... Verse 2 in your translation says, he takes it away. He, that does not mean he sends you to hell. And later on it says, um, he cuts off all, all the, the branches that are, have no fruit and are withered and he throws them in the fire. That, that's not a reference to hell. Okay? Because he's in you, so you're not going to hell. What that means is, uh, I'm taking a little divergent here. Just so you know it's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean you're going to hell. What it does mean is, Grapes, oh, I didn't have that picture of the grape tree. Oh, I had it in the computer and I forgot to put it in there, Rob. Never mind. Um, Rob, go into, okay, I don't know if you can do this. In the public folder, there's a picture called Grapevine. I'm sorry, this is called Flying by the Seat of Your Pants. Like, oh, I had this great Grapevine picture. I forgot to put it in the computer. But it's in the public folder. And you can, if, you can, if you can get there, if, if not, don't worry about it. But... Um, But the, the grape, oh, wow, you're quick, Rob. Have, have you ever been by a, a vineyard? Okay, the, it's weird because they're all, you know, what, about that high? Chest high, waist high? And in and, and a good vineyard that they're taking care of, all you see in the bottom couple feet is just a trunk coming up, right? A trunk maybe three, four inches, right? Kind of, sometimes it's kind of woody and withered. And this trunk comes up, and then it's got all these branches that come out, and they put you know, what do you call it, a trellis or whatever, wires and stuff. And so they, they tie up the vines and to get it up there because vines left to their own devices will go down to the ground and grow along the ground, right? And, and so that's a problem because when vines get on the ground, they get contaminated with mold and, and dirt and insects 
and, and they don't produce fruit on the ground. They don't get enough sunlight. It's just, they're just they're parasites. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a mess. And so they have to get these um, vines up, lifted up to where they can get air and, and sunshine and get away from the contamination of the ground, all right? So that's what it looks like. So, so Jesus says, um, I am the vine. And when he says vine, he means that trunk, okay? It's just, that's what, it's just terms we use. He says, I'm that trunk that comes up there. You are the branches that go out. Okay, so we're up, up top there. And then we produce the fruit, right? And he says, you're not going to produce fruit unless you're hooked up to the vine, which is that trunk, okay? So the word, okay, in verse 2, when he says, every branch that does not produce fruit, he takes away or he cuts off. If you look up in the original Greek, the word is eros. A, a, I, we would spell it in English, A-I-R-O-S. <laughs> it's primary meaning. Okay, let me, let me back up. It's fourth meaning. Okay, it's got like four main meanings, but the fourth one is very little used. means to cut off, take away. You know what the first three means, almost, especially the first one, which is the primary meaning? It means to lift up. It means to physically, physically lift up. Take away. Okay, take it away from the ground and lifting it up. That's what that means most of the time. And a lot of, a lot of um, Bible scholars are like, why did they translate that cut off? I mean, it can mean that because in John um, uh, 1, where, where John the Baptist is saying, oh, here comes, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They use that word eros, takes away. All right, he's taking away the sin of the world. All right, so that, that, that's where that word is used there, for instance. But most often, it means to physically lift up. It can also be metaphoric, like lift up your soul. So in the Bible, where, where it says God lifts your soul up, that's eros, lifting, lifting up. So think about this. What this probably really means, I, I think the best translation, and, I, and there's um, lots of scholars who say, that's right. I mean, I'm saying they're right. I'm not, they didn't copy me, I copied them. But any good vine dresser, when he walks by and sees a vine laying, a health, uh, well, a new vine that seemingly looks like it'd be good, laying on the ground, he's not going to cut it off right away. What's he going to do? going to take it and get it tied up on the trellis, right? He's going to lift it up, get it to a place where it can get some sunshine and get it away from the contamination of the earth, get it away from all that mold and mildew and parasites and bugs, right? So here, here's what when Jesus is saying, I think, I think he's saying this, I'm, I'm so sure I'm going to preach it, but <laughs> that if, if, you're, if you have no fruit, Jesus is at work, well, God the Father at work because he's the vine dresser, to lift you up, to separate you from the contamination of the world, to make you holy. That's what the word holy means, to be separated from sin. Now, now we understand that our salvation comes um, by trusting in Jesus Christ. We don't have to do good. I mean, we don't have to, we can't be perfect. We can't be good enough to get to heaven on our own. It's, it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that gets us to heaven, right? That being said, when we are saved, we're called to live a holy life, a life that is separated from sin. In, in other words, we just can't keep doing the same things we've been, the sin, same sinful things we've been doing. It, it's not a, a heaven or hell issue. It's are you going to live for Christ issue or not? Are you going to produce fruit or not? Because if you're going to insist, no, I'm going to live down in, in the dirt. I'm going to live down in the, with the world. I'm going to keep getting drunk. I'm going to keep having sex with lots of different people. I'm going to keep uh, being angry. I'm going to keep looking at pornography. I'm going to keep gossiping. I'm going to keep doing all If, if that's where you're going to be, that's where you're going to be. You will have no fruit. Because you can't grow fruit when you're contaminated with the junk of the world because it, it keeps you from bearing fruit. Can you have leaves? Yes. 
they'll just be full of mold and parasites. Are you saying, are you calling me full of mold and parasites? No, I'm just saying that, that God is at work trying to separate you from that. Do you understand? He want, he's trying to lift you up. He's not cutting you off. He's not, he's not saying, it's part of the world. Get out. Get you out of here. He's not doing that. He's saying, whoa, that's not going to work. And he gets down. He takes, takes you up and he puts you up where you can get some sunshine and some air and get away from all that contamination. How cool of a picture is that? He's at work trying to do that. And if, if you're here, if you're right here, that's what he's trying to do in your life right now. That's why, <laughs> that's why life can be such a struggle for people struggling with those things because they feel, they feel like such a struggle is going on. It's like, hello, yes, of course there's a struggle going on because God's trying to lift you up out of that. But you're struggling to stay there because you like it. <laughs> but I'm, I'm telling you, you'll, you'll like this a lot more. I can tell you that by experience. So, he's trying to separate you from the contamination of this world, a response from you is required. <laughs> God doesn't force you to do things against your will. He's, he's doing everything he can to encourage you and influence you to separate yourself from the junk of the world, the sin of the world. But a response from you is required. Are you going to respond with repentance? Are you going to respond by turning and going the other way? Are you going to separate yourself from that? It's like, well, I'm so used to it. It's like, it's what I like doing. It's, it soothes me. It's, it's my medicine. It's my therapy. I don't care what you call it. It's, <laughs> let's call it what it is. It's sin. And it, until you get separated from that, you're not going to bear fruit. But a response is required. You have to respond and say, I'm, I'm separating myself from that. So, so what, if you're, what if you're some fruit? Okay? Maybe, maybe you've allowed God to separate you from the contamination of the world, but and now you've got a little bit of fruit. There's a little bit of fruit in there, right? Okay, i got a little bit of fruit. God wants you to be here, right? Hopefully you want to be here, but you're here. So what's, what's going on here? Well, God tells us in, in John 15. If you're producing some fruit, God the Father is at work cutting away things in your life that keep you from bearing more fruit. Okay, so he says if you're producing no fruit, he lifts you up and gets you to, uh, separates you from the contamination, gets you to a place where you can bear some fruit. Okay, so what if you, so if you're, Bearing some fruit, how do you go from bearing some fruit to bearing more fruit? Okay, how do, you make, how do you make the shift from here to here? How do you get more fruit? He prunes. He cuts things away, right? In verse 2, he says, um, Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear what? More fruit. So he's trying to take you from some fruit to more fruit. How does he do that? He's at work trying to cut away the things in your life that are keeping you from bearing more fruit. And you know, you know what's hard? Is a lot of those things are good things. A lot of those things aren't evil, right? I mean, the evil things, the evil things, he's already cut away here. Right? I mean, you, you've responded. You say, like, I, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting rid of com, uh, the contamination of this world. I'm separating myself. I'm getting up off the ground. I'm getting out of the dirt, and I'm, I'm going to respond, and I'm, I'm separating myself from sin. Awesome. So then you go here, and you start producing some fruit. He's cutting away. He's pruning away things in your life that are getting in the way of producing more fruit. Could they be bad things? Could be. Could they be Good things, yes. <laughs> oh man, I got to be careful because I get, mm, I get passionate about the things we get. We get so wrapped up 
This is all about priorities. <laughs> we have so many priorities in our life, so many urgent things, so many things, and we're just busy, busy, busy. I mean, everybody I talk to is busy. Retired people who don't have a job or busy, just ask them, right? I'm not making fun of retired. I was like, I'm, I'm a little jealous, but... But I'm saying, but you know, if you're retired, you know what I'm talking about. You're like, people say, oh, I'm, I'm busier now than I ever have been. Everybody's busy, just ask them. I'm not saying being busy is bad, but, but have we messed up our priorities? And what, are thing, what kind of things does God want to prune away in your life? Pruning can sometimes hurt, but it's not, it's not the same as discipline. All right? God disciplines us, and that's more like the empty box when he's trying to separate you from the contamination. That's where the discipline of God comes in, and it's not a painful discipline or a hurtful discipline. It's a loving discipline. I'm, I'm talking about the pruning. When, and I've shared this before, but I'll just share it again. When I was rejecting the call of God is because... Farming was a priority. I had a farm, um, grew up on a farm. My wife and I farmed for 16 years. And it was my farm, and it was going to be my boy's farm, and that's what we do, we farm. Oh, I'll tithe off the farm, and I'll go to church, and I'll, you know, I'll be involved, I'll do those things. It was my farm. And it became almost like an idol and a priority. That first, everything else second. And God pruned that away. And at the time... Um, it was painful, but it was because, listen, I've called you to bear fruit, and this is getting in the way of you bearing fruit, all right? Is, is, is getting that seven-point bull elk an evil thing? No. That could be a very awesome thing. Again, I'm jealous. I've never even shot at an elk before. Spent hundreds of dollars on tags, but never even shot at an elk. But if that becomes your priority, if that becomes what you become fixated on, maybe the Lord's trying to prune that back a little bit. Am I saying you should never go hunting? No, don't hear what I'm not saying. Or fishing or any kind of recreation. I'm talking about recreation in general. That became, that's just, it's, it can become crazy, especially in this location, because we have so many opportunities. If that, if that is your focus, if that's your priority, Maybe God the Father, is at, if you're a believer, is at work trying to prune some of that back a little bit so that you can focus on producing fruit instead of just doing what you want to do. Family can be the same thing. And here's where I try, I'm going to try and not get too amped up. But, and I, I know I made lots of mistakes as a father, and I'm not holding me up as, hey, I was a dad that had all the answers because I didn't, and I don't. But I'm telling you, it's getting... I sound like an old man, but I don't care what it sounds like. It's getting crazy with kids today. I mean, they got, it's like they got to be in, there's so much pressure for them to be involved in everything and go, 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 go all the time. I mean, it's like, well, they'll never, they'll never be, uh, make the volleyball team in high school if they don't start in second grade going to volleyball camp. They'll never be good in football. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, go, I'm, please don't hear what I'm saying. I, I love sports, and I think it's good for people it's good for people, but it can get crazy, and it can, it can become a priority, and, I, and I'm, I'm just going to say it, and I mean, it's not very popular, but especially in these like class B schools, class A, class C, it gets crazy. It becomes such a priority that people just get so focused on it, and they got to start them in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, and go, 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 and then by the time they graduate school and they haven't won the state championship, then they wander out in the world, and it's like, well, what was that all about? I thought we were in a state championship. Whew. And then it's just, because they haven't learned how to produce fruit because they had too many other priorities that got in the way of producing fruit. There, am I done? Can I quit now? Thank you for letting me say that. I'm not, again, do not hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that, that sports is evil and, and kids being involved in things are evil and hunting and recreation is evil and and whatever else I said, farming and ranching and your own business, I'm saying that when that becomes a priority and it it's, gets in the way of you 
producing much fruit, God's going to be at work trying to cut some things back. And the reason so many Christians are in turmoil is they're fighting against that. Like, God, what are you trying to do? I'm asking you to bless my business, or I'm asking you to bless my, my whatever, whatever. I'm asking you, it's like, yeah, but the problem is you're, you're a little bit too far. I, I'm asking you to do this. And, and he's trying to prune some things back. And there's this, this struggle going on with God that we don't even know is with God. We don't even know what it is. Why is this so hard? Why is this so hard to do this? It's hard, maybe, because God's trying to cut it out of your life. Maybe, right? And it's different for everybody. So, I, you know, don't say, well, I got a farm. Is he going to take that away? <laughs> that was my deal, right? It's probably not your deal. Maybe it is. I'm just saying that, oh, I've said enough. You got it, right? That, that he's going to... He's, if you want to go from some fruit to more fruit, you've got to allow God to prune some things out of your life. And maybe it's attitudes. Maybe it's not activities. It could be activities because that's what we seem to focus on, but it might be attitudes. He, he might be trying to prune some attitudes out of your life that's preventing you from doing that. All right. Again, a response is required. If you're going to move from some fruit to more fruit, a response is required. He's saying, I'm trying to prune some things out of your life. Will you allow me to do that? Will you just back down Jack for a second? And, and you have the ability and right to say, no, I will not. Full steam ahead. I'm doing my deal. I want what I want and I'm going for it. It's the American dream. Amen. See, the response is required. Will you partner with him in those pruning things? Will you have the guts to say, Lord, what do you want to prune out of my life? What's, get, what's getting in the way of me having much fruit? If there's, do you, I mean, I'm serious about this. Do you have the guts to say that? I mean, he wants you to do that, but do you have the guts to do it? Because you're afraid of what he might say. You're afraid of what he might want to cut out, right? And Because everybody thinks the worst. Well, he's going to take everything fun. That's not true. It's not true. I'm telling you, the more you try and prioritize and do your own thing, the less fun it is, right? When you let God prioritize for you and you let God do some pruning, am I right? Life is so much, it's easier and it's more fun. It's more fulfilling. It's, 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 paradoxical or oxymoronic, it's one of those two. I don't know, maybe both. Anyway, well, to produce more fruit and much fruit, okay? So we're going to move from here to here to here, all right? How do you do that? You must initiate abiding in Jesus. All right? It's, it's a 180-degree turn from what you're doing here. Here, these two require a response. Yes, Lord, I will turn from the, my ways. I will turn from the ways of the world. I will turn from contamination. I will separate myself from sin and, and, and follow you. Okay, that's a response, right? Here the response is, Lord, I will, I'm responding with what you want and I am, I am working with you to, to prune things out of my life. All right? So we're responding. Here, the, we're initiating. Okay? So, so get the picture. Here, with no fruit or some fruit, God's initiating. Right? We're responding. That makes sense? He's initiating. He's, he's trying to separate things. He's trying to lift you up. He's trying to prune things away. Right? He's initiating that. Here, we initiate. We connect to the vine. In verse um, 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. The, the word ab abide is a verb. It means to, to stay or reside with, right? You're going to live with them. All right? If you're going to 
if you're going to move in with God and with Jesus, that's, you initiate that, right? Because you're invited. Jesus is looking for a roommate, right? I know he lives in you. I understand that, right? I'm not saying he's not there. But have you, have you moved in with him? Have you initiated that relationship where, okay, I'm not just visiting you on Sundays, Jesus. I'm moving in, all right? Where do I put my toothbrush? <laughs> You're moving in with him. You're abiding with him. We get, the word abide is related to the word abode. Abode means house, right? You have an abode, you have a house, right? It's kind of related. Abide, you're, you're living with him. You're there. Some of your Bible translations say remaining. You remain with him. You live with him. You dwell with him. You're there. You must initiate that. Jesus does not come with a U-Haul and start packing you up, metaphorically speaking, and move you to, to, uh, in with him right? You have to initiate that. Again, it's, it's 180 degrees different from here. So, so if you're here or here, you've got to be responding to what God's doing in your life. If you're here or here, to get here or here, you need to start initiating, hooking into Jesus, living with him, not just visiting him on Sundays, but really living with him and dwelling with him. David wrote this in Psalm 24. 27, verse 4. It says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. A lot of people make that to read, after I die, I want to live with the Lord forever. Well, we will, if you've accepted Him as Lord and Savior. But he's talking about right now. I want to live with Him right now. Now, that's one thing I seek, is to be with him forever. And then in Psalm 84, he writes, Better is one day in your courts, in your house, than a thousand elsewhere. Abiding, living with, hooking into, letting that, that holy sap <laughs> run into you. By the way, that's an inside job, right? Sap runs on the inside, doesn't run on the outside. Well, if you see sap on the outside, it's not doing much good, right? It's, got a, it's an inner work that has to go on. I'm going to close with this last point, and we'll have the worship team come forward um, as I'm closing here. And that's this, the abundance that comes from abiding in Jesus brings joy to our life. Jesus closed this little section in, that we just read by saying this in verse 11, he says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. <laughs> so many people are looking for happiness, which is, ex um, is based on external circumstances that they're willing to be contaminated by the world to look for that, that happiness. And it doesn't bring happiness. I mean, seriously, does this look happy? <laughs> and people say, my life feels empty. Yeah? Because it is. No hard feelings. This is the fullness that counts, Right? This is the real deal. By, this, by the way, this is real fruit. It's not plastic fruit. This is real fruit. This is the real thing. This is where the joy is. And remember when I said that this is easier than this? Why is that? Because when we're here, it's like it's... The reason we're here is because... The reason it stays empty is because we're battling God. He's, we're battling the vine dresser. Battling the vine dresser. We're battling the guy who's trying to get us here... Because we want to do our own thing. He goes, no, I want this for you. And you might be saying, well, I want this for me too. But I want to do it my own way. Like, well, good luck with that. Because Jesus says, There's, no. That does not, unless, unless you're connected with me, abiding with me, let, let my holy sap flow into you, this is not going to happen. 
So that's why I say this, this life not only is more joyful, it's easier than this life because it's less turmoil. So producing fruit, much fruit, is not harder. In a weird way, it's actually easier. It's easier. Your life will be much more, more fulfilling, much more restful, much more relaxing, but you've got to allow God to do a work in your life. So how are you going to respond? You know, depending on where you're at. Either you've got to be responding in a couple different ways. Lord, separate me from the co contamination that's in my life so I can start bearing some fruit. Or if you've got some fruit, Lord, start. What do you need to cut away, Lord? I'm, I'm open. I'm ready. Show me what needs to be cut away. What are you trying to do in my life that will make me more fruitful? I hope, I hope you remember this visual. I hope it inspires you. And I hope you understand that it's not working harder, it's just making different choices. That makes sense? You don't have to work harder. In fact, you probably work less. This is hard work back here. <laughs> this is easier. Would you stand with me? I just want to, I just want to pray for you. Jesus, you are the vine. We are the branches. And we confess we can't, we can't produce even a smidgen of fruit without you. Lord, so even to produce some fruit, we need you. But Lord, you've called us, not suggested, but you've told us, you've commanded us to produce much fruit. And Lord, that you said the only way to do that is connect with you full time. We have to take up residence with you. We have to live in you and with you and not just visit you every once in a while. Lord, we pray for abundance, the abundance of fruit in our life. That abundant life you promised us, Lord. We pray for that. Give us a desire for that, Lord, and help us to be courageous in our responses to you, Lord, the things that you're trying to cut away in our life, the, the things you're trying to lift us away from, the contamination of this world, the, the things you're trying to cut away in our life that are even good things, Lord, that are, will be hard to see not in our life, Lord, but, but for whatever reason, they're, they're an obstacle to more fruit and much fruit. Lord, give us the courage to, to just verbalize that and to accept it and to allow it. Lord, we want to produce much fruit. I just pray you show each and every one of us through your Holy Spirit what you're doing and how we need to participate with that. We pray for fruit that will just overflow in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.